The Autobiography of Benjamin Franklin, Chapter 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Benjamin Franklin, edited by Frank Woodworth Pine. Chapter 8. Business Success and First Public Service. About this time there was a cry among the people for more paper money, only fifteen thousand pounds being extant in the province, and that soon to be sunk. The wealthy inhabitants opposed any addition, being against all paper currency, from an apprehension that it would depreciate, as it had done in New England, to the prejudice of all creditors. We had discussed this point in our junta, where I was on the side of an addition, being persuaded that the first small sum struck in 1723 had done much good by increasing the trade, employment, and number of inhabitants in the province, since I now saw all the old houses inhabited, and many new ones building, whereas I remembered well that when I first walked about the streets of Philadelphia, eating my roll, I saw most of the houses on Walnut Street, between Second and Front Streets, with bills on their doors, to be let, and many likewise in Chestnut Street, and other streets, which made me think the inhabitants of the city were deserting it one after another. Our debates possessed me so fully of the subject that I wrote and printed an anonymous pamphlet on it entitled The Nature and Necessity of a Paper Currency. It was well received by the common people in general, but the rich men disliked it, for it increased and strengthened the clamor for more money, and they, happening to have no writers among them that were able to answer it, their opposition slackened, and the point was carried by a majority in the house. My friends there, who conceived I had been of some service, thought fit to reward me by employing me in printing the money, a very profitable job, and a great help to me. This was another advantage gained by my being able to write. The utility of this currency became by time and experience so evident as never afterward to be much disputed, so that it grew soon to fifty-five thousand pounds, and in 1739 to eighty thousand pounds, since which it rose during war to upwards of three hundred and fifty thousand pounds. Trade, building, and inhabitants all the while increased though I now think there are limits beyond which the quantity may be hurtful. Begin footnote. Paper money is a promise to pay its face value in gold or silver. When a state or nation issues more such promises, then there is likelihood of its being able to redeem the paper representing the promises depreciates in value. Before the success of the colonies in the revolution was assured, it took hundreds of dollars of their paper money to buy a pair of boots. End footnote. I soon after obtained, through my friend Hamilton, the printing of the Newcastle paper money, another profitable job, as I then thought it, small things appearing great to those in small circumstances. And these, to me, were really great advantages, as they were great encouragements. He procured for me also the printing of the laws and votes of the government, which continued in my hand as long as I followed the business. I now opened a little stationer's shop. I had in it blanks of all sorts, the correctest that ever appeared among us, being assisted in that by my friend Brennetnall. I had also paper, parchment, chapman's books, etc. One Whitemarsh, a compositor I had known in London, an excellent workman, now came to me and worked with me continuously and diligently, and I took an apprentice, the son of Aquila Rose. I began gradually to pay off the debt I was under for the printing house. In order to secure my credit and character as a tradesman, I took care not only to be in reality industrious and frugal, but to avoid all appearances to the contrary. I dressed plainly. I was seen in no places of idle diversion. I never went out a-fishing or shooting. A book, indeed, sometimes debauched me from my work, but that was seldom, snug, and gave no scandal, and to show I was not above my business, 
I sometimes brought home the paper I purchased at the stores through the streets on a wheelbarrow, thus being esteemed as an industrious, thriving young man, and paying duly for what I bought. The merchants who imported stationery solicited my custom. Others proposed supplying me with books. I went on swimmingly. In the meantime, Keimer's credit and business declining daily. He was at last forced to sell his printing-house to satisfy his creditors. He went to Barbados, and there lived some years in very poor circumstances. His apprentice, David Harry, whom I had instructed while I worked with him, set up in his place at Philadelphia, having bought his materials. I was at first apprehensive of a powerful rival in Harry, as his friends were very able and had a good deal of interest. I therefore proposed a partnership to him, which he fortunately for me rejected with scorn. He was very proud, dressed like a gentleman, lived expensively, took much diversion and pleasure abroad, ran in debt, and neglected his business, upon which all business left him, and finding nothing to do, he followed Keimer to Barbados, taking the printing-house with him. There this apprentice employed his former master as a journeyman. They quarrelled often. Harry went continually behindhand, and at length was forced to sell his types and return to his country work in Pennsylvania. The person that bought them employed Keimer to use them, but in a few years he died. There remained now no competitor with me in Philadelphia, but the old one, Bradford, who was rich and easy, did a little printing now and then by straggling hands, but was not very anxious about the business. However, he kept the post office. It was imagined he had better opportunities of obtaining news. His paper was thought a better distributor of advertisements than mine, and therefore had many more, which was a profitable thing to him and a disadvantage to me, for though I did indeed receive and send papers by the post, yet the public opinion was otherwise, for what I did send was by bribing the writers, who took them privately, Bradford being unkind enough to forbid it, which occasioned some resentment on my part, and I thought so meanly of him for it, that when I afterward came into his situation, I took care never to imitate it. I had hitherto continued to board with Godfrey, who lived in part of my house with his wife and children, and had one side of the shop for his glazer's business, though he worked little, being always absorbed in his mathematics. Mrs. Godfrey projected a match for me with a relation's daughter, took opportunities of bringing us often together, till a serious courtship on my part ensued, the girl being in herself very deserving. The old folks encouraged me by continual invitations to supper, and by leaving us together, till at length it was time to explain. Mrs. Godfrey managed our little treaty. I let her know that I expected as much money with their daughter as would pay off my remaining debt for the printing-house, which I believe was not then above a hundred pounds. She brought me word they had no such sum to spare. I said they might mortgage their house in the loan office. The answer to this, after some days, was that they did not approve the match, that on inquiry of Bradford they had been informed the printing business was not a profitable one, that types would soon be worn out and more wanted, that S. Keimer and D. Harry had failed one after the other, and I should probably soon follow them, and therefore I was forbidden the house and the daughter shut up. Whether this was a real change of sentiment, or only artifice, on a supposition of our being too far engaged in affection to retract, and therefore that we should steal a marriage, which would leave them at liberty to give or withhold what they pleased, I know not, but I suspect the latter, resented it, and went no more. Mrs. Godfrey brought me afterwards some more favourable accounts of their disposition, and would have drawn me on again, but I declared absolutely my resolution to have nothing more to do with that family. This was resented by the Godfreys. We differed, and they removed, leaving me the whole house, and I resolved to take no more inmates. But this affair having turned my thoughts to marriage, I looked round me and made overtures of acquaintances in other places, but soon found that, 
the business of a printer being generally thought a poor one i was not to expect money with a wife unless with such a one as i should not otherwise think agreeable a friendly correspondence as neighbours and old acquaintances had continued between me and mrs reed's family who all had a regard for me from the time of my first lodging in their house i was often invited there and consulted in their affairs wherein i sometimes was of service i pitied poor miss reed's unfortunate situation who was generally dejected seldom cheerful and avoided company i considered my giddiness and inconsistency when in london as a great degree the cause of her unhappiness though the mother was good enough to think the fault more her own than mine as she had prevented our marrying before i went thither and persuaded the other match in my absence our mutual affection was revived but there was now great objections to our union the match was indeed looked upon as invalid a preceding wife being said to be living in england but this could not easily be proved because of the distance and though there was a report of his death it was not certain then though it should be true he had left many debts which his successor might be called upon to pay we ventured however over all these difficulties and i took her to wife september first seventeen thirty none of the inconveniences happened that we had apprehended she proved a good and faithful helpmate assisted me much by attending the shop we throve together and have ever mutually endeavoured to make each other happy thus i corrected that great erratum as well as i could begin footnote mrs franklin survived her marriage over forty years franklin's correspondence abounds with evidence that their union was a happy one we are grown old together and if she has any faults i am so used to them that i don't perceive them the following is a stanza from one of franklin's own songs written for the junta of their chloe's and phyllis's poets may prate i sing my plain country joan these twelve years my wife still the joy of my life blessed day that i made her my own End of footnote. about this time our club meeting not at a tavern but in a little room of mr grace's set apart for that purpose a proposition was made by me that since our books were often referred to in our disquisitions upon the queries it might be convenient for us to have them together where we met that upon occasion they might be consulted and by thus clubbing our books to a common library we should while we liked to keep them together have each of us the advantage of using the books of all the other members which would be nearly as beneficial as if we each owned the whole it was liked and agreed to and we filled one end of the room with such books as we could best spare the number was not so great as we expected and though they had been of great use yet some inconveniences occurring for want of due care of them the collection after about a year was separated and each took his books home again and now i set on foot my first project of a public nature that for a subscription library i drew up the proposals got them put into the form by our great scrivener brockton and by the help of my friends in the junta procured fifty subscribers of forty shillings each to begin with and ten shillings a year for fifty years the term our company was to continue we afterwards obtained a charter the company being increased to one hundred thus the mother of all the north american subscription libraries now so numerous it is become a great thing itself and continually increasing these libraries have improved the general conversation of the americans made the common tradesmen and farmers as intelligent and most gentlemen from other countries and perhaps have contributed in some degree to the stand so generally made through the colonies in defence of their privileges thus far was written with the intention expressed in the beginning and therefore contains several little family anecdotes of no importance to others what follows was written many years after in compliance with the advice contained in these letters and accordingly intends for the public 
the affairs of the revolution occasioned the interruption begin footnote here the first part of the autobiography written at twyford in 1771 ends the second part which follows was written in passy in 1784 after this memorandum franklin inserted letters from abel james and benjamin vaughan urging him to continue his autobiography End of footnote. It is some time since I received the above letters, but I have been too busy till now to think of complying with the request they contain. It might too be much better done if I were at home among my papers, which would aid my memory and help to ascertain dates. But my return being uncertain, and having just now a little leisure, I will endeavour to recollect and write what I can. If I live to get home, it may be corrected and improved not having any copy here of what is already written i know not whether an account is given of the means i used to establish the philadelphia public library which from a small beginning is now become so considerable though i remember to have come down to near the time of that transaction i will therefore begin here an account of it which may be struck out if found to have been already given at the time i established myself in philadelphia there was not a good bookseller's shop in any of the colonies to the southward of boston in new york and philadelphia the printers were indeed stationers they sold only paper etc almanacs ballads and a few common school books those who loved reading were obliged to send for their books from england and members of the junta had each a few we had left the alehouse where we first met and hired a room to hold our club in i proposed that we should all of us bring our books to that room where they would not only be ready to consult in our conferences but become a common benefit each of us being at liberty to borrow such as he wished to read at home this was accordingly done and for some time contented us finding the advantage of this little collection i proposed to render the benefit from books more common by commencing a public subscription library I drew a sketch from the plan and rules that would be necessary, and got a skilful conveyancer, Mr. Charles Brockton, to put the whole in form of articles of agreement to be subscribed, by which each subscriber engaged to pay a certain sum down for the first purchase of books, and an annual contribution for increasing them. So few were the readers at that time in Philadelphia, and the majority of us so poor, that I was not able with great industry to find more than fifty persons mostly young tradesmen willing to pay down for this purpose forty shillings each and ten shillings per annum on this little fund we began the books were imported the library was opened one day in the week for lending to the subscribers on their promissory notes to pay double the value if not duly returned the institution soon manifested its utility was imitated by other towns and in other provinces the libraries were augmented by donations reading became fashionable and our people having no public amusements to divert their attention from study became better acquainted with books and in a few years were observed by strangers to be better instructed and more intelligent than people of the same rank generally are in other countries when we were about to sign the above-mentioned articles which were to be binding on us, our heirs, etc., for fifty years, Mr. Brockton, the scrivener, said to us, You are young men, but it is scarcely probable that any of you will live to see the expiration of the term fixed in this instrument. A number of us, however, are yet living, but the instrument was after a few years rendered null by a charter that incorporated and gave perpetuity to the company. The objections and reluctances I met with in soliciting the subscriptions made me soon feel the impropriety of presenting oneself as the proposer of any useful project that might be supposed to raise one's reputation in the smallest degree above that of one's neighbors, when one has need of their assistance to accomplish that project. I therefore put myself as much as I could out of sight, and stated it was a scheme of a number of friends who requested me to go about and propose it to such as they thought lovers of reading in this way my affair went on more smoothly 
and I ever after practised it on such occasions, and from my frequent successes can heartily recommend it. The present little sacrifice of your vanity will afterward be amply repaid if it remains a while uncertain to whom the merit belongs. Some one more vain than yourself will be encouraged to claim it, and then even envy will be disposed to you justice by plucking those assumed feathers and restoring them to their right owner. The library afforded me the means of improvement by constant study, for which I set apart an hour or two each day, and thus repaired in some degree the loss of the learned education my father once intended for me. Reading was the only amusement I allowed myself. I spent no time in taverns, games, or frolics of any kind, and my industry and my business continued as indefatigable as it was necessary. I was indebted for my printing-house, I had a young family coming on to be educated, and I had to contend with for business two printers, who were established in the place before me. My circumstances, however, grew daily easier. My original habits of frugality continued, and my father having, among his instructions to me when a boy, frequently repeated a proverb of Solomon, Seest thou a man diligent in his calling, he shall stand before kings, he shall not stand before mean men. I from thence considered industry as a means of obtaining wealth and distinction, which encouraged me, though I did not think that I should ever literally stand before kings, which, however, has since happened, for I have stood before five, and even had the honour of sitting down with one, the king of Denmark, to dinner. We have an English proverb that says, He that would thrive must ask his wife. It was lucky for me that I had one as much disposed to industry and frugality as myself. She assisted me cheerfully in my business, folding and stitching pamphlets, tending shop, purchasing old linen rags for the paper makers, etc., etc. We kept no idle servants. Our table was plain and simple our furniture of the cheapest. For instance, my breakfast was a long time break, and milk, no tea. And I ate it out of a twopenny earthen porringer with a pewter spoon. But mark how luxury will enter families, and make a progress in spite of principle. Being called one morning to breakfast, I found it in a china bowl, with a spoon of silver. They had been bought for me without my knowledge by my wife, and it cost her the enormous sum of three-and-twenty shillings, for which she had no excuse or apology to make, but that she thought her husband deserved a silver spoon and a china bowl, as well as any of his neighbours. This was the first appearance of plate and china in our house, which afterward, in a course of years, as our wealth increased, augmented it gradually to several hundred pounds in value. I had been religiously educated as a Presbyterian, and thought some of the dogmas of that persuasion, such as the eternal decrees of God, election, reprobation, etc., appeared to me unintelligible, others doubtful, and I early absented myself from the public assemblies of the sect. Sunday being my study day, I never was without some religious principles. I never doubted, for instance, the existence of the Deity, that he made the world, and governed it by his providence, that the most acceptable service of God was the doing good to man, that our souls are immortal, and that all crime will be punished, and virtue rewarded, either here or hereafter. These I esteemed the essentials of every religion, and being to be found in all the religions we had in our country. I respected them all, though with different degrees of respect, as I found them more or less mixed with other articles, which without any tendency to inspire, promote, or confirm morality, served principally to divide us, and made us unfriendly to each other. This respect to all, with an opinion that the worst had some good effects, induced me to avoid all discourse that might tend to lessen the good opinion another might have of his own religion, and as our province increased in people, 
and new places of worship were continually wanted, and generally erected by voluntary contribution, my might for such purpose, whatever might be the sect, was never refused. Though I seldom attended any public worship, I had still an opinion of its propriety and its utility when rightly conducted, and I regularly paid my annual subscription for the support of the only Presbyterian minister or meeting we had in Philadelphia. He used to visit me sometimes as a friend, and admonished me to attend his administrations, and I was now and then prevailed on to do so, once for five Sundays successively. Had he been, in my opinion, a good preacher, perhaps I might have continued, notwithstanding the occasion I had for the Sunday's leisure in my course of study, but his discourses were chiefly either polemic arguments or explanations of the particular doctrines of our sect, and were all to me very dry, uninteresting, and unedifying, since not a single moral principle was inculcated or enforced, their aim seeming to be rather to make us Presbyterians than good citizens. At length he took for his text that verse of the fourth chapter of Philippians, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, or of good report, if there be any virtue or any praise, think on these things. And I imagined in a sermon on such a text, he would not miss of having some morality. But he confined himself to the five points only, as meant by the apostle, viz., one, keeping holy the Sabbath day, two, being diligent in reading the holy scriptures, three, attending duly the public worship, four, partaking of the sacrament, five, paying a due respect to God's ministers. These might be all good things, but as they were not the kind of good things that I expected from that text, I despaired of ever meeting with them from any other, was disgusted, and attended his preaching no more. I had some years before composed a little liturgy, or form of prayer, for my own private use, viz. in 1728, entitled, Articles of Belief and Act of Religion. I returned to the use of this, and went no more to the public assemblies. My conduct might be blamable, but I leave it, without attempting further to excuse it, my present purpose being to relate facts, and not to make apologies for them. End of chapter 8